converted is not found in your bulletin. This is a different sermon than the sermon listed in your bulletin. Amen. 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 It is a different sermon than the one listed in your bulletin. So it's found in Joshua chapter 6. In Joshua chapter 6. Amen. If you have any phone but a flip phone, you can use your phone to find Joshua chapter 6. Amen. Amen and praise God. Joshua chapter 6. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua. Joshua chapter 6. Amen. Amen. If you have a Bible, amen, you can use your Bible. Amen. Amen. Joshua chapter 6. Amen. So, some folks need to lift up their Bible going, that's why I bring my Bible. Amen. Amen. It's good to see you on today. We were in a, our, our weekly uh, staff meeting on Tuesday. We have a weekly staff meeting around. 2 o'clock, at 2 o'clock, and uh, we go over everything, and uh, I, I saw a number I didn't recognize, and so I went ahead and answered it, and there was a student on the line that said, Pastor, I said, yes, and said, I want you to know I got a 98 and a 89. Uh, they said, I'll be graduating, and I just wanted to thank Shiloh for their support, because I would not have been able to graduate, but for the support of Shiloh. Amen, yeah. That made me cry. I had to hold back the tears. Amen. I, I thank God for your faithfulness. And we really get to be part of investing in people. There's nothing like investing in people. Amen. Amen. And that's been the history of Shiloh. I'm just, I'm just preaching before I, I, I preach. Amen. That's been the history and the legacy of Shiloh for generations. Amen. If you know our, our church treasurer, her last name is McNeil. She comes from a large family, a, a large family, like seven, eight, nine kids. I, exact number. Well, as a little girl, her home was burnt to the ground. And so Shiloh said, we have a parsonage. We want to put your family in the church's house until you guys can get somewhere else to stay. Amen. Amen. All right, let me continue. Amen. Joshua chapter 6. You should have had enough time to find it. Amen. Joshua chapter 6. And it reads like this. We're going to read uh, 1 through 5. And then we'll pick up 15 and 16, it reads just like this. Now Jericho was shut up inside and outside because of the people of Israel. None went out and none came in. And the Lord said to Joshua, see, I have given Jericho into your hand with its king and mighty man of valor. You will march around the city all the man of war going around the city once. Thus you will do for six days. Seven priests shall bear, bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. On the seventh day you shall march around the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets. And when they make a long blast with the ram, ram's horn, when you hear the sound of the trumpet, then all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city will fall down flat, and the people shall go up, everyone straight before him. Verse 15, on the seventh day, they rose early at the dawn of day and marched around the city the same manner seven times. It was only that day that they marched around the city seven times. And at the seventh time, when the priests had blown the trumpets, Joshua said to the people, Shout, for the Lord has given you the city. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And praise God. Do me a favor and find seven people. I know, seven people, and just say, Hold fast. Come on, come on. We got to move quickly. That's one, that's one, that's, that's two. Hold fast. My brother, my sister, you got to move a little bit. Hold fast. Hold fast. Hold fast. Hold. Oh my, you almost got it now. Come on, hold fast. Let us pray. And now, God, we thank you for your presence. We thank you for your spirit. 
We thank you for your power. We thank you for all you've already done. God, give us now a spirit that would be singularly focused on you. Center our thoughts. We bind the enemy in the name of Jesus. We came to get a word, God, not just a sermon, but a word. Bless us now with a word from heaven. Bread of heaven, bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. Solo Dio Gloria, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. I know we are in a season of fasting, and when I think about fasting, I think about most of the disciplines that achieve and accomplish anything. Trusty Timmons, most, if not all, of the disciplines that achieve and accomplish anything, Reverend West, are related to the idea of persistence. It, it, it's not a one-time thing. It, it, it's not a momentary thing, but it requires some consistency. If you're going to make a marriage work, it's going to require some tenacity. Why don't you say that, tenacity? If you're going to get your degree, it requires some relentlessness. If you're going to do what God has called you to do, it requires some tirelessness. Think about it. Most of us took some time this morning to brush our teeth. Yeah, yeah, you do. Amen. You don't have to say amen, but I know you did. Amen. I can feel it in the room. Amen. And, and, and had you missed this one day, you probably would have been okay. But what makes brushing your teeth so powerful is that you do it consistently. There's something about pushing through and being consistent. You may not feel like it. No one might cheer you on. There may not be some sign for celebration. But you understand, based on your maturity, that it takes some tenacity to get to where you're trying to get to. And I believe this text is tailored to teach us that there are just some things in life that require that we hold fast. That there are some things in life that require that we keep on going even though we don't see it, even though we don't feel it, even though we don't have a squad telling us to keep on going. Just keep on going. That's the story in our text. Because in our All right. Okay. In our text, let me know when we're ready. Okay. In our text, we're introduced to a wonderful story of the people of God. You see, the people of God had been given a promise by God. And I want to let you know that whenever God gives you a promise, he always keeps his word. Yeah. It might be off in the distance. It might be a prophecy. But every promise that God gives, God keeps his word. You don't know when it's going to happen. You don't know how it's going to happen. And sometimes you don't even know why it's going to happen. But when God gives a promise, God will keep his word. This is the promised land. God had promised the people that he would give them this land that they would be the inheritors of this great land. They would be the heirs to this great land. God said, I've got something for you. I'm going to give it to you. Yeah, amen. I'm going to give it to you. I'm going to bless you with it. Please understand, it wasn't likely, yeah. It wasn't likely. It was unlikely. It was uncomfortable. And it was really unpredictable in which the way the Lord was going to give it to them. Please understand that everybody knew Jericho. Jericho was a special place because it was guarded, if you will, by great walls. Yeah, we, we say the wall of Jericho, but it was really two walls. And these walls were on great hills. So if you were to add the hill plus the stone uh, up, it went almost to 40 feet. We're familiar with Jericho because over the years, there have been multiple excavations. Multiple persons, four major excavations, have gone and dug out and dug up these walls, and they all agree there were some great walls. Now, there are 
differ on when the walls were there and how the walls fell, but they all agree that Jericho existed and there were great walls. And God had told the people of Israel, his promised people, amen, that's you and me, his promised people, just think about promise for a minute, his promised people that he was going to bless them. They were his promised people. But what they had promised him seemed so far out of reach, Hodari. It seemed so possible, so unlikely, so just not uh, in with reality. It seemed like a dream. No, it seemed like a pipe dream. How in the world was God going to give Israel what he promised them? How in the world was God going to give the people of God the promised land? Now, there was Joshua, and Joshua was a trained warrior, but keep in mind, they were not called to do the kind of war they had done in the past. Look at the text. The text is clear. It doesn't say anything about fighting with swords. It doesn't say anything about ramming the walls. It doesn't say anything about climbing the walls. It just said, follow my plan. And I've come by to tell somebody that whenever God gives you a promise, then God has a plan. Woo. Whenever God gives you a promise, then God has a plan. And it's not your job to develop the plan. It's just your job to obey the plan. Yeah. Now think about David. Uh, God had the plan. All David had to do was obey the plan. Think about Mary. God had the plan. All Mary had to do was obey the plan. Think about Esther. Uh, God had the plan. All Esther had to do was obey the plan. God has a plan. The only question is, will you obey God's plan? Mm, I said it. I meant it. I'm here to represent it. For all of us, there's a question on the table. There's a question. There's a motion. And the motion, the question is this. Will you obey God's plan? It may not be comfortable. It may not be what you thought of. It may not look like what you wanted to do. You may not drive what you wanted to drive. You may not even live where you want to live, but will you obey God's plan? Because if you obey God's plan, then you will receive God's promise. I know I'm in the Bible. This text is tailored to teach us that God has a plan, and when you obey God's plan, then you'll have a victory. I'll say it again. God has a plan, and when you obey God's plan, you will receive God's victory. I don't know what area of life it is. It might be your physical health. It might be your mental health. It might be your financial health, but God has has a plan, and if you obey God's plan, you will receive a victory. God will show you just what to do and how to do it. God has a way when there seems to be no way. He works things out you cannot see. God will make a way for me. God has a plan. Oh, yes, he does. God is so particular. God is so powerful that he always has a plan. He had a plan for creation. He had a plan for redemption, and he has a plan for you. Let me take this text and preach it real quick, and then I'll be out your way. Amen. The first thing this text is tailored to teach us is that you got to hold fast in your calling. Please understand, this is really the sequel. This is the sequel. This is the sequel to what God started with Joshua. Because earlier, Joshua was about in his 20s. Amen. He was a young whippersnapper. He had a whole lot of energy. He never had back pain. He didn't have a whole lot of wisdom, but he had a heart for the Lord. And if you got a heart for the Lord, even if you're not the greatest intellect, even if you don't have the most experience, if you got a heart for the Lord, the Lord says, I can use you and I will use you. And so he was following an old but gifted godly dude named Moses. Would you say Moses? Now Joshua was following Moses in everything he did. When Moses walked in the office, Joshua showed up and said, can I get you some coffee? He was right there supporting him. He said, let me drive you to the revival, man. Let let me drive you to the meeting. You know, he was right there. He wanted to glean and grow from his mentor or his ment his mentor, Moses. There was Joshua. Now, Joshua was sent uh, by the leader, Moses, to do some reconnaissance. Now, reconnaissance is a strange word. It really means before battle, it's good to scope things out. Uh, it's good to check things out uh, with a gangster lean. You go in and you try to stay low and look around and see what's going on. Well, they sent 12 spies into the promised land. There were 12 spies, and you probably only know the name of two. You probably know the name of Joshua and Caleb. I'm running through Numbers chapter 13. Yeah, in Numbers chapter 13, it tells us of the prequel to the scene that we read. And then they went through, they came back with great impressions. Oh, yeah. They had great
great impressions. They knew something important was getting ready to happen. They could feel it in their bones. They could feel it in their spirit. They knew something was in the air. And so they started talking like this. They said, now look, God gave us a promise, and everything God promised is true. God said it, and he meant it, and God is represented. Yes, he is. Uh, look, there's grapes that are so big. You see these grapes we brought back? We had to carry them between two men because the grapes were so big. Oh, wow. Everything. There's honey in the land. There's milk in the land. Everything is in that land. We can take the land. Let's do it right now. Amen. That, that was the first response. But then the other ten, the majority said this. They said, now look, we could take the land, but there are giants in the land. And because they're giants in the land, we're like roaches. I'm sorry. We're like grasshoppers to them. They could just step on us and crush us. Why would we go into the land to fight those big old giants? I mean, these are the sons of the Amalekites. What's wrong with you? Why would we go into the land? Now, look, Joshua right then in the King James said that he spoke up. But if you were to read it really and understand it, he said, shut up. He said, shut up. We're going to take the land. Shut up. We can do this. But the majority outruled him. And so he was stuck there. He was wondering, why didn't we take the land? But they were afraid. Amen. They were afraid. But look, Joshua didn't get held up with their situation. Yeah. Joshua didn't let the fact that a few of them didn't want to do right keep him from doing right. He was was willing to be in the minority and say, God, whatever you tell me to do, I'm going to do, even if I got to do it all by myself. And I just came by to tell you that God has put some stuff in you, that God has put a calling in you. That, okay, y'all not feeling me. Tony Evans tells the story, the true story, when he worked at a loading dock. Yeah, he worked at a night shift, Tony Evans, Dr. Tony Evans in Texas, worked at a loading dock. And the deal was that folk really didn't load the dock at night. Half the crew would sleep and they would uh, uh, let the other half work and then they would trade off. But Dr. Tony Evans said, I don't believe that is right. In fact, my grandma would say, that's stealing. So I'm not going to participate with you. They said, if you don't participate with us, then you're going to stick out like a sore thumb. You better do what we're doing. He said, no, I'm going to do what God called me to do. I'm an honest kind of brother. I don't believe in stealing. I, I don't believe in doing wrong. I'm going to do right. And look, it wasn't long while he was on the job, there was a big meeting. And in this meeting, the boss has said, we've been watching, we've been monitor, we've been looking at the night shift for the past six months, and here's what we noticed, y'all been cheating the company. So we're not going to fire you all, but we're going to give you a new soap supervisor. Dr. or oh, excuse me, brother uh, Tony, Tony, come here to the front. This is your new supervisor. He's your new supervisor because while you were doing wrong, he was doing right. And all I'm trying to say is sometimes you got to stick out like a sore thumb. Sometimes everybody else is smoking and passing, but you decide not to smoke and pass. Sometimes everybody else is laying around, but you refuse to lay around. Sometimes everybody else is playing the numbers. But you refuse. Yeah, but you refuse. To start. Yeah, sometimes everybody else is gossiping. Sometimes everybody else is mistreating their spouse. Sometimes everybody else is doing wrong, but you say, I'm going to do right, even if I have to do right all by myself. And I want to let you know that if you are the minority with God, then you are the majority. If you're standing with God, then you're not standing alone. If you're standing for God, then you're not standing alone. Go ahead and stand out. Go ahead and be the one, uh, the oddball out. That's all right. God's got you, God sees you, and God is with you, and God is for you. Amen. Amen. Let me move on. So first, first it's the idea of hold fast in your calling because Joshua understood that he couldn't make others do what God told them to do. He just had to do what he was called to do. I know I'm in the Bible because that's why he said, as for me and my house, he's arguing the case. Now, I can't make you do what God told you to do, but as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Amen. I'm feeling this thing. Amen. Praise God. So first, you got to hold fast in your calling. God called you to do it. God called you to go right. God called you to marry her. God called you to marry him. God called you to be faithful. God called you to live right. Do what God called you to do. But don't only be uh, hold fast in your calling. you got to hold fast without complaining. I was counting the amens there. I think we had about seven. Amen. Amen. You got to hold fast without complaining. 
Now, I hope you notice the pun because we're in the season of fasting. And I said hold fast because this was an interesting uh, march around Jericho. Because one of the commands or one of the primary commands while they were marching around Jericho is they weren't allowed to speak. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah all of heaven said shut up. Yeah, all of heaven said, be silent. Yeah, all of heaven said, don't talk. You can say amen, amen. All of heaven said, be silent. Now, can I explain to you why all of heaven said, be silent? Because you remember, okay, okay, now I need to illustrate this. Y'all not getting this, amen, amen. Let, let me tell you a true story, a true story. I, I was about uh, maybe 10 years old, okay, maybe nine years old. And I had an older brother and an older sister. Our practice was, when it was time to go back to school, you got a new pair of jeans and a new shirt. Yeah, you got a new pair of jeans and a new shirt. And if the Lord was really, really moving, you might even get a new pair of shoes. Amen, amen, amen. Now, I was the youngest, so I also got me some pretty good hand-me-downs. But I remember this particular time. I, I, I got a new pair of jeans and a new shirt, and my parents, they went off above and beyond. I had some new shoes. These tennis shoes were the bomb diggity. I mean, they, they were white and gray. They had a pair of wings on the side. You know, I mean, these were the bomb diggity. I just knew that when I went back to school, everybody was going to be trying to be like me. Everybody would be talking about my shoes. I'd have friends, new friends, because they'd say, look at the shoes the brother's in. He's a new man. He, he's a bad brother. He's a bad man. Okay, he's a bad brother. I just knew people would be talking about my shoes because I had some new shoes. Until, until my sister said something to my brother. Brother. Yeah, my sister said something to my brother, and then my brother said something to me. I said, what do you mean these are shoes for poor people? Uh, what are you trying to say? They said, those shoes are pro wings. I said, what's wrong with pro wings? I like my wings. They make me want to fly. I said, those shoes are pro wings. They come from pay less, and they're for pro people. I said, wait a minute, don't talk about my shoes like that. These are my new shoes, and they, they begin to dig in my spirit. They, they begin to dig in my heart. And before I knew it, those shoes that I was walking around, yeah, I was walking around like I was the man. I was starting to think, I can't wear these shoes. These shoes aren't good enough. These shoes aren't nice enough. These shoes are from Payless. These shoes are pro wings. These shoes are for po folk. And I said to my mom, I said, look, mom, I can't wear these shoes to school. And my mom said, why can't you wear those shoes to school? I said, because my brother told me what my sister told me, and I won't have any friends if I wear these shoes. And she said, that's the problem with listening to complaining folk. They will mess you up. You better wear those shoes or you'll get your, well, never mind. So the, here's the story I want you to get. Uh, that's the problem with complaining. See, complaining will mess you up. Complaining is a poison, and when it gets in your spirit and when it gets in your heart, it will make you think that the good things aren't good, and the bad things are much bigger than the good things. Come by to talk to somebody. It might be in your marriage. Please stop complaining. It might be on your job. Please stop complaining. It might be in life. Please stop complaining. If you want to find a way to be depressed, complain. You don't understand it, so i got to preach it. The truth is, complaining is a poison, and it will kill you. Her name, her name is A-A-S-I-A. -A -A. I believe it's pronounced Asiya Bibi. Yeah, she's from Pakistan, true story. And a few months ago, she was arrested because she wanted to poison her new husband. She wanted to poison her new husband because she wasn't feeling him anymore. Yeah, amen, amen. She wasn't feeling him anymore. So she got a little bit of milk and she put a whole lot of poison in it. He wouldn't suffer long because it had so much poison in it. As soon as he took a hit, uh, excuse, excuse me, as soon as he took a shot, excuse me, excuse me, as soon as he took a sip, he would drop dead to the ground. Well, unbeknownst to her, her husband decided he didn't want any milk that morning. And instead of drinking the milk, uh, the mother-in-law uh, used it to make a punch or a drink. Yeah. It was a cultural drink, and all the family came over. Literally 27 people drunk that, 17 of them died, and all the rest were in critical condition last I checked. All I'm trying to say is when you complain, you are poisoning your family. When you complain, you are jacking yourself up. Now, she's on death row. Uh, she might even be headed, be beheaded by now, but all because of complaining. Look, God takes complaining so serious that in the Old Testament, he would literally open up the ground and swallow complainers up. Yeah, mm -hmm. 
I'll just keep on preaching. All I'm trying to say is complaining is dangerous. Yeah, you got to get a grip on your complaints or they will mess you up. True story, I promise you. I tell this story whenever I talk about complaining and you will hear this again and again. Yeah, uh, true story, I promise you. I used to go to this cheap suit store and, and there was this young man that I would always buy my suits from him because I wanted to encourage him and support him. But one day he told me that he was going to be uh, laid off from this job and he was complaining about the job. He said, you know what, they did they mistreated me and they didn't give me this and they didn't give me this and they didn't give me this and I worked so hard and they mistreated me. I don't know why they laid me off. And about a half an hour after he finished complaining, I left with some socks so I could just get up out of there. But I remember he got a new job, but this new job wasn't at a cheap suit store. It was at an expensive suit store. I said, I'd like to support the brother. Let me see if I can buy a suit even though it's a little above my price range. You know, when you got kids, you don't do all that upper French stuff, all upper Italian stuff. You know, you live within the American stuff. Amen. Amen. And so, and so I went to the suit store, and I was glad to see him. Had a big smile on my face, but I noticed he had a frown on his. I went to buy my suit, and I started talking to him about the new suit in this new suit store. And this brother started complaining to me about the job that laid him out slash fired him. Now, we were in a new suit store. He had a new job, but he was still complaining about the old situation. I said, yeah, brother, this seems like a new, new suit. This seems like a nice suit here. It's not shiny like the other suits. This seems like this might be able to wear away. I might even be able to preach in this. I think this is great. He said, but did I tell you how they talked about me? Did I tell you how they underpaid me? Did I tell you how they didn't appreciate me? Did I tell you? And after he got finished singing the blues, uh, I got up out of there and I didn't buy anything. I remember the next time I went to see him, I thought I had enough change in my pocket. I'm going to buy something this time. And I, I went in, I asked about him, they said, he's no longer with us. I had to ask myself, I wonder why they got rid of him. Hmm. Not really question. I, I know the answer because he was complaining too much. And a lot of times, God will move you into a new blessing, but you're so fixated on your past pain, your past problems, your past troubles, your past hurts, your past harms, that you can't appreciate your next because you're still focused on your ex. And all I'm trying to say is God says that complaining is dangerous, so he had to march around the wall in complete silence because he knew what would happen if people started to complain. Hallelujah and amen. So first, the lesson is that you You've got to hold fast to your calling. God has called you to it. God has called you for it. God has equipped you in it. Do it, do it, do it. But not only that, you got to hold fast without complaining. Because complaining is poison and it will kill everybody, including you. But not only that, uh, look at the text. The next lesson we learn from this text is hold fast until it's complete. Amen. Would you say that? Hold fast. Until it's complete. I feel this thing. I'm going to take my seat, but I'm feeling this thing. Hold fast until it's complete. One of the lessons I've been trying to teach my boys, my boys help me around the house. They do chores, and, you know, we try to do tasks together. It's, it's father-son bonding. And I tell them, you're not complete until I say you are complete. Yeah, because what they would do, they would vacuum like half the room. Half the room would have lines all over it, nice, nice lines. And then the other half would somehow be missed. And they'd say something like, well, nobody walks over there. So we didn't think we needed to vacuum over there. I said, look, 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 no, you got to get over there. But no, whoa, whoa, whoa. Or they do half the dishes and the other dishes would just sit in the sink. They'd say they weren't on the counter, you know. Or something like that. And so their reasoning was interesting, but it wasn't right. So we had to establish a new rule. This is how you know you're done with what you've been called to do. The way you know you're done with what you've been called to do is I will tell you you're done with what you've been called to do. Until I say you're done, you are not done. So do not stop until I tell you to stop. And I've come by to talk to somebody who's married. I've come by to talk to someone who's working a job. I've come by to talk to someone who's trying to lose some weight. I've come by to talk to somebody who's trying to learn the scriptures. I've come by to talk to somebody who's trying to get a degree in their 40s, 50s, or 60s. I want to let you know that you're not done until he said you're done. You're not done because you're tired. You're not done because they're talking. You're not done because you're uncomfortable. You're not done because you don't see progress. You are only done when the Father says you are done. Until then, you got to be faithful. You got to stand firm. You got to be on minister wood. You got to keep on keeping on. Even if you don't feel like it, even if it doesn't look like it, notice that nothing happened to the wall. They marched around and around and around. Day one, day two, day three, day four, day five. Nothing happened. Even common sense would have said, this isn't working. Let's throw 
on the towel. Let's quit. We're not getting anywhere. We're not advancing. Aren't you tired? I'm tired. Let's give out. Let's give up. Let's give in. But God said, no, keep on marching. And the good news is, if you keep on marching, after a little while, when it's all said and done, when you are finished, God will bless you. I know I'm in the Bible because 14 times in that chapter, it says seven, seven trumpets, seven priests, and seven times. And seven is a message. Seven for the believer always represents completion. On the seventh time, they would be done. But until it's complete, don't you stop. You got to be like the bamboo. You familiar with the bamboo plant? You familiar with the bamboo plant? Some say it takes four or five years before the bamboo plant even breaks the ground. So there the neighbor is. He's outside. He's watering the ground. Every day in the morning, the neighbors start to wonder, hey, man, we notice you water the same piece of dirt every day. You've been doing it for a few years. Is everything all right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, is everything all right? Year two, year three, year four. But then around year five, something happens. They say that the bamboo tree or plant will break the ground. And it grows at least eight feet, but it keeps on growing and doesn't stop. There's something about the bamboo. It's like faith. See, when you practice faith, it's not what you see. It's not what you feel. It's what he said. And because God said it, because God said it, you got to keep on doing it. Because God called you to it, you got to keep on going. It doesn't matter if you feel like you're winning. It doesn't matter if you feel like you're getting rich. It doesn't matter if your body feels tight. Keep on keeping on. Because God said, keep on going on. I preach to you, but now let me preach to the empty seats. Because God told me that if we keep praying and we keep praising and we keep preaching, that God would send people from the east, the west, and the north and the south. So we're going to keep on going because God said, keep on going. I'm not tired, but I believe God because God has shown me something in my spirit. God has shown me something in my heart. God has shown me something in my body. I feel it all over me. But keep on on keeping on and after a little while we'll be able to testify because he'll say well done well done well done good and faithful servant God has something in store for you just keep on keeping on keep on pushing keep on praying keep on praising keep on fighting and God will he'll show up and show out and the whole world will have to testify that can't nobody do you like the Lord. Can't nobody do you like the King. Jesus, Jesus, won't he do it? No, you got to throw back your heads. Won't he do it? Say yeah. He will. He will. He will. Oh, yes, he will. We're standing to our feet. The doors are open. I, I, I can't give God commands. I don't do that. I don't believe in that. I, I'm not of that persuasion where you command things to God. But one of my requests of God is like, God, can you can you give me the word you want me to preach on my Monday so I can work on it and think of it all during the week, right? And so when God gives me a word, like Friday and Saturday, it throws me off. I start arguing, I'm like, God, you know, we already had an agreement on this thing right here. God, we're going to go through Matthews, we're going to do this. But every now and then, God says, I want you to step out. I want you to try and stretch out. And I'll take care of you. I'll provide for you. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior. If you're here today and you don't have a membership, a fellowship, a family called a church. If you're here today and you have not been baptized... I want to challenge you to take a step of faith. I want to challenge you to try. In fact, let me tag one more on there. If you're here today and you are not involved in a ministry, amen, you're on the roll and you show up from time to time or from week to week, either one, but you're not in a ministry, I want to challenge you that God does his best in those who are vested. I'll say it again. That God does his best in those who are connected. It's difficult for God to bless distant disciples. 
He can do it. But his desire is that you're so close to him that you glean and grow and get more and more as you go along the journey. If you're here today, church home, baptism, salvation, or you need to join a ministry, we want you to come forward now. It's a statement of faith. We, we know that. We believe that. We know there's always questions. There's always something interesting that we all want to know or ask about what's next or how we do what we do. And I want to challenge you to take the step of faith, that God is absolutely faithful. He's a keeper. He will bless you. If you're here today, salvation, membership, baptism. Come on. Come on. Take the step of faith. God's been talking to your heart. He's been wrestling with you. You felt something in your spirit. You felt something in your heart. He's been calling you. Today is the day of salvation. The Bible says, harden not your heart, but come. And now, God, we thank you for all you're doing in this place. God, we ask that you give courage and strength and power. Give them the capacity like Joshua to take it, to take it, to take it, Lord. Help them to know that there's a blessing in the step, in the step of obedience and the step of faith. We thank you, God, that your word is not cluttered or confusing, but it's absolutely clear. Help us now to follow in your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Salvation, membership, baptism, or if you want to join the ministry, come on down the aisle. You don't have to walk alone. Your neighbor will walk with you, amen. All you have to do is stretch your hand out. Stretch your hand out. Somebody will walk with you. Do me a favor and ask your neighbor, can I walk you down this aisle? Come on, look them in the eye. You're looking at me. I'm looking at you. Look at your neighbor. Come on. Look at your neighbor. Look at the eye. Can I walk you down this aisle? Come on, come on. Can I walk you down this aisle? Hold your chin up. Put a smile on your face. Can I walk you down this aisle? never know how God wants to use you. Can I walk you down this aisle? Today can be the day. This can be the hour. God is moving and he's even moving in you. Hallelujah. Come on, come on, come on. We receive you. We welcome you. Amen. 
So we want you to know how we exist and what we do. And you will see that Shiloh is very, very faithful to the community, to people, to all those who are around. I mean, we, we par partner with the school. We're doing great work. The school is doing great things. I mean, God is really blessing Shiloh. And he does that because and through you. So we want you to come. It's at 930. I promise you I won't hold you long. Amen. We won't hold you long. Amen. It's going to be a wonderful celebration of information. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. We praise God for our sister pastor for uh, her leading us in worship and giving us all the announcements. They're very, very important. She was right on all of them. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Amen. 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 She was right on all of them, uh, including the date that's wrong. That's the 13th. That was my fault. So please, please make sure it's the 13th. If you haven't started fasting, it's not too late. Amen. Amen. You could fast from sugar. You could fast from caffeine. You could even fast from alcohol. Amen. Whatever the Lord has laid on your heart, I said it. Amen. Whatever the Lord has laid on your heart to do, it's a great time to fast. You're asking God to do three major things in this body, to to build this body, meaning to send others, to build unity in this body, to even add more unity to what God has already done, but also to increase stewardship. We have a vision to do so much more than we're already doing. Amen. And we do a lot. Every day of the week, there are people in this building, literally. There are 400 at least, well, not quite 400, I'd say 200 at least, Monday through Friday. And that doesn't include the adults. Amen. 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 Uh, Deaconess uh, Wilson, she's, did I say it right? That's why I'm at. Deaconess Williams, amen. She and her team, they're in the food pantry and the clothing pantry, seeming like every day of the week. Whenever I show up, they sh they're here, amen, giving out food or clothes and working real hard. Uh, so we just want to encourage you to participate, continue to participate in what we're already doing. It will bless your heart. You ought to come, just watch sometimes and see what God is doing. To see people get a bag of food or to go to the Lord's kitchen and see people get a wonderful meal. You can actually sit down and eat with anybody there. Amen. It's a blessing. Amen. 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 And praise God. Let me offer the benediction. But remember, this benediction is uh, conditional. Amen. You can't leave. You got to stay for the meeting. Amen. Amen. Find someone and say these words. <clears throat> I love you. God loves you. We are. Because God is. You are never alone. Never, never, never. Now hug them and stay in peace. Amen, 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 amen. Hallelujah.